Hey everybody, welcome back to Submarine History, where today we are going to talk about the direct drive propulsion system U-boats used in the Second World War. I chose this topic uh, because when I did my trip to the Buffalo Naval Park to see Dr. Alexander Clark and Drakenefell this past spring, I spent some time on the USS Kroger, uh, a Gato class which underwent a guppy conversion after World War II. One of the things I found intriguing about the Kroger was that it only had three diesel engines. One had actually been removed, likely, during its guppy conversion. And I had a hard time figuring that out based on my knowledge of U-boats. That, in turn, made me start to question what I actually know about the propulsion on U-boat systems themselves. So here we are today. We're going to talk, in general, about how U-boat direct drive propulsion systems worked and how they were the same and different from what the U.S. did during the war. As always, uh, if you want to stop the briefing at any time to study a slide, feel free to do so and post any questions you have in the comments section below. I enjoy studying the history and technology behind submarines, but I'm no way an expert, and I welcome everybody's comments and critique. Okay, so let's go. Thank you to the United States Naval Institute for doing the work they do to preserve naval history from around the world. Consider supporting USNI with a membership so they may continue their mission long into the future. Also, uh, I do have a Discord. Uh, you should be able to grab a server invite from the link that's embedded in the uh, banner for the channel. If you have a problem with it, post a comment in the uh, section below. So today we're going to study the Type 7C U-boat, uh, but this propulsion arrangement was common to most U-boats. Um, as such, uboatarchive.net is the primary resources, resource regarding the Type 7C propulsion system. I can't, emph I can't emphasize uh, what a great job Jerry Mason has done uh, with that information repository. Uh, on this list of references, uh, Friedman's book, and the article by Alden, uh, those were excellent references discussing the development of the diesel electric drive system that was used on the uh, Gatos and classes that succeeded it. Um, what I like about Friedman is that, uh, you know, he's not a U.S. Navy fanboy. He's fair, but he's also critical about uh, U.S. Navy decisions where propulsion systems were concerned. Now, in order to talk about propulsion systems on U-boats or really any submarine, it's helpful to spend a minute talking, you know, Naval Architecture 101 regarding displacement hulls. Submarines utilize the displacement hull form factor, which provides a smooth and stable ride on the surface as the hull moves through the water, pushing and cutting it with very little propulsion. Uh, displacement hulls use more flu excuse me, use more fuel, and, uh, and they tend to be slow. Uh, battleships are another example of a displacement hull. Now, there are two water-related resistances that a boat or ship deals with on the surface. The first is the resistance due to friction from the wetted surface area of the hull. Uh, the resistance due to this friction is proportional to the wetted or underwater surface area. The other water-related resistance that a boat or ship deals with on the surface is the resistance due to waves. This resistance uh, is equal to the speed of the vessel divided by the square root of the length of it. When that resistance is calculated and the value is greater than 1.0, we say the vessel is fast. So hydrodynamically fast vessels must concentrate power in small spaces. Uh, they require great power per ton. And we just said displacement hulls are slow so that's kind of confusing, but just stay with me. Here is a chart comparing the calculated values for wave resistance among a sampling of submarines. The theoretical limit of the resistance due to waves is 1.34. And that is because as we get closer to 1.34 or try to get beyond it with a, with a displacement hull, the cost of the power plant is so high, it's not economically worth it. In other words, the challenge is, for a fixed hull length, how close can we get to the RW value of 1.34? Said otherwise, 
how fast speed-wise can we go while being able to afford it. What this table suggests is that the HL Hunley has lots of room to increase its speed, except for that period of time, non-human power plants didn't exist for submarines. It also suggests that for Germany, the Type 9D U-boats were starting to push the envelope uh, with regards to speed, giving their hull length. And this is just sort of that graphical representation. This, uh, this chart actually contains information for displacement, semi-displacement, and planing hulls. Uh, but we're only interested in the dis displacement hull, which is in that red box. But you can kind of see how that line kind of goes vertical to infinity uh, as our resistance to weight ratio increases. And, you know, it does appear to our peers that our limit is about 1.34, because to get beyond that, you have to invest so much in the power plant. Um, you just, you know, it, basically it can't be done. So early submarines did not have the power plants available to maximize the res wave resistance, which limited their uh, utility. So we need a big breakthrough in technology if we're going to use submarines productively. The first big breakthrough is the discovery of the lead acid battery process by Gaston Planté in 1859. This doesn't immediately help the issues related to submarine propulsion, but it does get people thinking about the possibilities, if it can be solved, how to charge those batteries. Um, early on, steam propulsion, which was the next step up from human propulsion, as we saw in the case of the H.L. Hunley. But um, early on, steam propulsion for surface running and compressed air for submerged travel promised to solve this problem. But it takes too long for steam engines to make power when starting up and when submerging. Um, the residual heat from shutdown of the steam boilers makes the interior of the submarines unbearable. Uh, but by the 1880s, lead acid batteries are making their way into submarines, but we still have the problem of charging. It hasn't been solved. In 1876, Nicholas Otto provides the first big breakthrough for submarine power with his four-cycle gasoline engine process, uh, which is what most internal combustion engine vehicles use to this day. Now we're able to quickly start and stop mechanical engines and control their heat so we don't cook the crew. However, the downside is that gasoline engines are unsafe in enclosed space because of the gasoline fumes and the low flash point of it. The risks are both explosion and crew incapacitation. Now in 1897, Rudolf Diesel develops the first successful diesel engine. His namesake engine eliminates the hazards related to gasoline while being more efficient, durable, and providing the high torque needed for a seaborne vessel. The first practical application of a diesel electric power plant is achieved by the French with the submarine uh, Agrede, I think, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, which was commissioned in 1908. So this is a schematic uh, of the diesel drive system for a Type 7C U-boat. Um, this is from uh, the uboatarchive.net website. Uh, I like this because not only schematically does it show the layout of the uh, power plant components, but it also has the English translation. But uh, you would have two of these. This is say this is the port side uh, engine, and then you would have this duplicated on the starboard side. But you can see here at the start of the drivetrain, we have a uh, we have the six cylinder diesel engine. There's a coupling that connects us to the uh, e motor, which is in line with the diesel. Uh, there's another coupling. And then some seals and shafts, and then finally the uh, propeller. Okay, so let's talk about how the Germans actually made these drive systems work. All right. So, in diesel engine only drive, both diesel engines drive the propellers via the diesel engine coupling um, through the E motors, main couplings, and the propeller shafts. In this arrangement, the E-motors are just a part of the drivetrain and the armatures are unpowered. Uh, the diesel engines are directly driving the propellers. With E-motor only drive, the diesel engine coupling is unclutched. 
The e-motors are powered by the battery drive, uh, the bat propellers via the main couplings, and the propeller shafts. In support mode, uh, the power output of the diesel engines is increased by switching on the e-motors. The buffer mode is uh, used in rough seas. The diesel engines drive the ship's propellers, as in the you know, diesel engine only drive. The e-motor voltage is adjusted such that with normal conditions, the loading and discharge current are zero. If the screws run above the surface, causing an unintentional reduction of the load on the diesel engine, the e-motor works as a generator, preventing an inadmissible increase in diesel RPM. In diesel electric drive mode, um, this allows driving both propellers even if one diesel engine has failed. The operational diesel engine works directly driving the propeller on its side. The e-motor, whose armature would normally run idle, now works as a generator delivering power to the other side of the ship. The e-motor on that other side drives the propeller. The diesel engine clutch is dis disengaged. The current from the primary motor can be switched uh, such that it only drives the secondary e-motor or an additional light charge on the batteries takes place. Charging operations can be uh, differentiated as follows. Charging with a disengaged propeller shaft or charging while running on the surface with diesel engines. When charging with a disengaged propeller shaft, the diesel engine drives the e-motor via the diesel engine clutch. The e-motor runs as a generator and charges the stored batteries. When charging while on the surface with the diesel engines, the diesel engine power drives the propeller. Uh, at a constant number of revolutions from the diesel engine, the e-motor charges the batteries. Uh, in this case, the diesel engine must provide power for the propeller and charging. Uh, this is typical for the Type 2, Type 7, uh, most of the Type 9s, and uh, many other U-boats. So how does this all compare to the United States uh, propulsion philosophy during World War II? The U.S., uh, it was in the same propulsion dilemma as every other country going into the 20th century. Uh, the USS Holland, which was the United States' first commissioned submarine in 1900, utilized a gasoline engine along with a lead-acid battery uh, pack. It was obvious that gasoline was not the ideal choice for motive power, and the U.S. Navy spent the 1920s trying to develop their own uh, suitable diesel engines and uh, even obtained a license to manufacture the MAN diesel engines that the uh, Reich Marine was using at that time with its U-boats. The U.S. Navy had difficulty developing their own diesel power plants, uh, and the MAN licensed engines did not perform to the Navy's expectations. Central issues were poor build quality, shaft noise, and vibration associated with the inline diesel propulsion system. Uh, which the U.S. Navy was not able to overcome. Now, by the 1930s, diesel electric propulsion systems were beginning to find their way into locomotives in the United States. And ultimately, the U.S. Navy looked to those propulsion systems to solve their submarine problem. With the diesel electric drive system, the job of the diesels is to power electrical generators, which in turn provide power to the electric motors, charge the batteries, and supply all the electrical power needs for the boat. In this arrangement, there is no physical connection between the diesel engines and the propellers. This does require a larger boat, uh, typically 1,200 tons or more. Uh, that wasn't a problem for the U.S. Navy since they needed a larger boat that had the speed and endurance to keep up with the fleet. The Navy would use diesel electric drives beginning with the Gato class, and after the war, the diesel electric drive system that the United States developed would become the standard worldwide for conventionally powered submarines. And that's it for today, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the briefing. Uh, post your questions below in the comments section. Till next time, peace out.